It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back to the Pain Exam podcast. And today I'm very, very happy to welcome Rudy Malayel, who is the president of West Virginia Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. And Rudy, I mean, he's a great guy. He invited me last year to teach ultrasound at the conference, which was an amazing venue in the Greenbrier in West Virginia. And this year he invited me back to lecture as well as run an ultrasound course, which if you're on my newsletter, you're well aware of. In addition to the West Virginia course, I do have an ultrasound course in New York in March as well as a regenerative medicine course in New York in May, which I just opened up to do a two-day course in which we're going to do Saturday regenerative medicine, in which we do a PRP demonstration at the end of the course, as well as Sunday ultrasound training. And then I have another um, um, course coming up in June and more to come. So just stay on my newsletter if you're studying for the boards. We're excited to introduce the Pain Exam app, the NRAP Academy Pain Board Review app, which will be coming out soon. They're they're finishing it up right now. And um, we have the Virtual Pain Fellowship, which is all encompassing pain management for the boards, CME, as well as your career. Rudy, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, great. this, uh, This early hour. I already went to the gym, and um, now I'm excited to do this. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was uh, Mr. Early Bird, but uh, wow, that's <laughs> so. So, Rudy, tell me first of all, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved with the society? And you know, just give us your your, your a quick bio. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, originally uh, from New Jersey, um, outside of New York City, then I did my internship, Cornell, uh, residency in physical medicine rehab at NYU. And then I did my anesthesia pain fellowship at what was then Beth Israel under Albert Einstein. But now um, in, in the end of that year, Mount Sinai took it over. Now it's all under Mount Sinai. Um, after fellowship, I decided I may want to leave the city for a little bit and um, made my way to, <coughs> excuse me, Huntington, West Virginia, where uh, there was Dr. David Carraway was uh, practicing at this uh, location. Um, and since I knew he was leaving and he wanted me to come in, came in, um, started practicing, um, and then he left to become the chief medical officer of, um, of Nebro. Um, learned a lot in this time and then ended up being out here for nine plus years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, in the last four of those years, uh, pre-COVID 2020, I became the president, or tw- end of 2019, became the president of WVSIP. Um, we, I had my first meeting at the Greenbrier in 2020, right before COVID, <clears throat> and then everything sort of obviously hit, you know, um, hit the fan, yes. and then <laughs> basically, and then. Uh, we try to restructure it. Uh, we did one in 2021, kind of a social distancing one at the Greenbrier, one of the only venues that was open at that time. Um, and then every year after that, we try to get back into it where we could we could grow. But it was just so hard um, after COVID to get sort of sort of people. But it was uh, it was a gr- it's always a great great conference. Uh, great lectures from the area. Uh, we this year we're having people from. We have Don Sparks from Hawaii. We have Nick Bremer from Florida. Uh, we have people from other states coming in as well, and not just the Maryland, Virginia, uh, and West Virginia area. But we also have um, Angela Buck from Kentucky, Mark Malinowski from Columbus, Ohio. So yep, we're having to we're having to get, and then yourself from New York. So we have everyone coming in. 
Yeah, I, I, I looked at the lineup. It's quite impressive. And um, I, I feel like it's going to be a lot bigger than last year. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to obviously every year you try to make it a little bit better. How do you tweak it? How do you make it a little uh, more? Uh, what what were we missing in the last meeting? Um, and we really wanted to focus. You know, there's a big push where a lot of physicians are now hospital based, um, outpatient based, or they're employed by some sort of uh, hospital group. But then there's you know a lot of the society meetings are kind of not focused on sort of private practice or or practice we really want to this one to kind of focus into that a little bit so if you're private practice uh you want to learn a little bit about about different changes in coding especially in the medicare world which we change which changes all the time um things that people are doing in different private practices and and how in ac settings office settings etc that's where we're trying to we're trying to focus it on no, that's great. I, I mean, I'm a big supporter of all the conferences and uh, societies because without it, we would just be lost. I mean, everything is changing. all right. And we need somebody like you leaders who who really are up to date on what's going on with, with policies, as well as, you know, the new tech and um, to, to to really make everyone aware. Um, because if I'm, I, exactly. I had a period of like five, six years where my kids were young and I didn't do any conferences. And then after they got old enough that I could just feel comfortable leaving them, um, I started going to the conferences and realized how much I was missing out by not going and, um, and, and just networking and talking to other colleagues and hearing what's going on around the country because because times change and it's better to be exactly. ahead. Exactly. So anyway. Um, Even one pearl advice could, should change your practice tremendously. Once you hear one small oh, thing, yeah. it could change. And, and it changes your practice and, and how you treat patients and, you know, and how, uh, what you can learn. It's just, it's so amazing. I'm definitely a better clinician and probably a better uh, manager of my practice since I, since I started going to these conferences. And like I tell my patients, pain management is changing every year, just because last year I didn't have as many, you know, so many options for you this year. There's like, you know, every year there's something else coming out, you know, new therapy, new drug, new treatment, Etc. cetera. So, um, exactly. anyway, uh, we, you know, Rudy and I, we, we talk, we talk a lot about ultrasound and interventions and Rudy found this great article. Rudy, you want to just tell them the story about, about what brought you to this article that we're going to talk about? Yeah. So, um, we're all, uh, probably like most of the people were, was watching the Super Bowl this year. And then there was a, there was a medication for postmenopausal hot flashes. And it sounded, um, you know, I'm not exactly what sure the drug was, but it just really kind of piqued my thought process on, wait, you know, it sounded like it was a sympathetic blocker or some, it worked on the sympathetic system. Um, and I never really, you know, as pain physicians, we don't, we don't deal in that world at all since maybe, you know, medical school or, or maybe some internship at, at most, but, you know, <clears throat> hearing about it sparked my thoughts. So, you know, did a quick Google search and found that synthetic blocks are useful and studied for um, postmenopausal uh, heart flat, heart, uh, hot flashes or even um, hot flashes after um, breast cancer and things like that when HRT is um, not effective or, or contraindicated because of their um, side effects. Or even, you know, some of the other medications that are used for uh, it sounds so familiar to some of the other medications that are used for hot flashes um, are similar to neuro our neuropathic pain or even our CRPS type of pain um, medication. So I looked into it, looked into stellar ganglion blocks, and there's there's just a bunch of studies. Um, they're documented on different websites like Mayo Clinic, et cetera. Um, and then there was this one study out in China that studied 40 people in about an eight month eight month period of time. I had a control group and a and a uh, gland, um injection group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm looking at the study now and I'm wondering and I don't see it. Um, were they targeting the right or left side? Oh, that I don't think I. I know most of the ones that were for PTSD. I think it kind of says that PTSD this one I did it typically. Um, yeah, I know they normally say that on that one. I did not see that in this study. 
Yeah, I would imagine. So, you know, for those of you not familiar, the satellite ganglion, they're using it for PTSD. I've used it for post-COVID anosmia. And I've seen, like, for both problems from my, you know, anecdotal experience, I see mon months of relief, very significant clinical improvement in PTSD symptoms, the sympathetic symptoms, as well as the post-COVID anosmia. Unfortunately, I can't say I've seen permanent cure, but the patients were definitely satisfied with it and wanted repeat injections. And it lasted more than a day or a week. It was more like months. So, um, in fact, I had one patient with awesome. uh, coffee grounds to my office. And she's like, yeah, this is the test. After my stellate, I just smell the fresh coffee grounds to see if I have my, 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 my smell back. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's really great. Was, was the patient excited after oh, the smell of the coffee grounds? <laughs> yeah, she was very excited. In fact, when I spoke at West Virginia last year, um, I had a slide on the stellate after that about all the, um, all of the, uh, I guess the, the mediators released or blocked when you do a stellate ganglion and you know you're reducing pulmonary edema you're reducing your um there's a neuro right. immune uh connection between the stellate ganglion and the immune system so a lot of the the um i don't have the slide in front of me so forgive me if i'm not speaking specific enough but you're down you're you're you're, you're suppressing some of the inflammation that gets released and that's that's why there was also a suggestion that stellate ganglion could help with post COVID, the cardiac, you know, the pot syndrome. So there's, there's really mm -hmm. a lot going on with the ganglion that's underappreciated. And if you look at the old textbooks, they say that a stellate ganglion block is, uh, in, is a treatment for pulmonary embolism, which of course, nobody's running to do a stellate in an acute pulmonary embolism <sighs> situation. However, right. it does reduce pulmonary edema causes pulmonary vas vasodilation. So, you know, theoretically, Hey, it, it may be the way to go. Maybe it's being underutilized. That's really amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. So, um, and then now with um, now with ultrasound and being safer, um, it could be and 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 with more portable ultrasound machines too. Then that was the other hurdle, right? It could right. be adopted a lot more and, and studied a lot better. Right. And uh, here's the thing with the cellate. I mean, thank God, I've never had a problem with a stellate, and I and I do them all under ultrasound. I think I did one under fluoroscopy, like my first month out as an attending after fellowship, and I and I and I was shooting conscious. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Let me just put an ultrasound there because <laughs> I'm in the esophagus. I don't need to get an esophagram after the fact. So um, right. Uh, the ultrasound made it so much easier. You know, with with being in the neck, risk of seizure, stroke if you do an intravascular injection. However. I mean, thank God, never seen that happen. So it, it could be a high risk procedure, but I've done so many and never had a problem. I think it's one of those things like driving a car. If you're cautious and careful and you, you know, you're practiced, right. responsible, probably nothing bad will happen. So right. it does deter the m main population though. Oh, when you yeah. hear, like you just keep hearing these warning signs. Um, but but it, it, it is, it's true. If you do it cautiously, carefully, and you know what you're doing, Obviously, it's going to be, it's, you know, more than not, it's going to be fine. Right. So, by the way, so if you, if you are interested in doing stellate ganglion blocks in your practice and you're not using ultrasound, this is something that at West Virginia SIP meeting, we will be discussing on April 13th and 14th um, in West Virginia. So, so check yeah. out the website, which is wvsipp.org. Yes. So, dot, uh, dot org or dot com. I think it's both of them, actually. But I know the dot com one works. Okay, so like you said, dot com because of um, there's going to be an all star group of physicians speaking. A lot of them you probably know their names if you've been to the conferences. So um, it's going to be a great event. So Rudy, are you doing a lot of stellates? Um, not as much. Really, more for CRPS. Um, I did contact one of the OB guys in my area that saying that I do want to think about doing a study with this and seeing if we could um, we both publish. We have an ob in residency in our town, so if <laughs> one of the med students and uh, residents and could want to kind of help write a paper, <coughs> excuse me, and um, and start seeing any results and, and how we do this. So I think I'm, I'm going to start doing this actually for uh, postmenopausal hot flashes, see how it is, see how it works, and. Um, maybe adopt it. But really right now I'm doing it mainly for CRPS upper extremity. I did two, I've done two for 
um, facial trigeminal pain that um, either had a trigeminal nerve block outside and was at an outside facility was not effective or at our facility was not effective and it actually also helped too so that's great i um i can identify with i have a patient who had tongue surgery cancer um and she had a flap in her tongue and she had chronic facial pain um they took grafts from her arms also so she had you know because you have to get these things approved also so she had arm pain related to the facial pain. And I wasn't sure if the insurance would pay for the atypical facial pain or post-operative facial pain diagnosis versus the causality of the arm. So when there's a causality of presence, just easier to get that thing proved. Um, right. Anyway, right. Um, it helped both her arm pain and the facial pain. I wouldn't say a hundred percent, unfortunately, but she said it was worth it. And she did probably three of them with, you know, a few months of relief. Um, and um I think it's a much under underutilized therapy. Um, and I think like you said, it's because of the fear factor of sticking a needle in the neck. Yeah. And then especially in the, you know, trying to get that word out to even the psychiatrist um, or even the, you know, post COVID and also, you know, like we we're talking, you're talking about just, it's a, it's amazing how much you could probably do this procedure on patients, but it's, you know, but we're not doing it as much because either A, it's not covered um, or B, we're just not target, you know, kind of targeting or marketing to those physicians or those patients. Right. Exactly. Now, I, I, I imagine they would not cover this for the postmenopausal um, sim symptoms. Um, no, probably not. And I, I think um, unless they do have some sort of incompetent um, um CRPS or pain type of symptoms, but really, I think it would have, it would probably have to be in the study. We're probably going to have to do it, um, you know, free, um, and then do, you know, after that, probably charge some sort of amount. And I, I don't know what any of that looks like. Haven't been, haven't done any of that, but um, probably that's where it's going to go. I'd say. Have you done that for the um, post COVID? For post-COVID, um, you know what? I, I think, I want to say, I think Medicare covered it for that pay. I think she was Medicare. Either way, I think it was covered. Okay. I don't know what her insurance was, but I think they actually paid for it. Um, I would be interested in a study to see if this helps with PMS. <laughs> then, right. you really, then you really have a market for this block. <laughs> right. Uh, especially, yeah. Because these medications have some so big side effects for the most part. Um, especially with the uh, HRT, um, you have you have some side yeah. effects with that and contraindication. So, yeah, a little lidocaine on a nerve is much safer than most medications. The question is getting the lidocaine there safely. So, that's where the skill comes exactly. in. And um, so, um, well, well, that's great. Thanks for sharing this article because I'm going to have the link to the article on the show notes. And I think this is something that we may be seeing more of in the future. And it's also, especially since lots of, you know, lots of us are getting choked by the insurance companies and lots of physicians are looking for cash paying procedures and other alternative means. And a lot of patients don't want to take drugs. So there's a lot of reasons why you actually may start to see stellate ganglions for the hot flashes being done more commonly, just like you see ketamine clinics pop up, more regenerative medicine, right. procedures, et cetera. I think the general population is moving away towards wanting to be on medications their whole life or part of their life. So, um, I, I wouldn't want to be as a, as, even as a physician, I would, I would try my best to, uh, try to be off of a chronic medication. You know what, Rudy, I, I had a cervical redict develop over the last year. And the last thing on my mind was taking an opiate for that. I mean, it was like out of the question. Right. You know, my worst day. I right. would, I, so like, you know, I think the population needs to get re-educated. Um, and um, and anyway, <laughs> on that note, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have anything to add um, before we close it up? Yeah, no, I just want to talk about the, the Greenbrier again, uh, just for those who want to come register. It's going to be a great meeting. It is in April and it's beautiful um in this uh, southern west virginia area in that time and it's um you could fly into you know i think it's roanoke you could fly into <coughs> dc you could fly into charleston west virginia um or just drive in if you're local and it is 
I, and you know, you've seen it. It's one of the most beautiful sort of um, little resorts that just they just do it really, really well. And oh, so you, um, if you bring your spouse or loved ones, um, there's so many activities that they could do. Um, and there's so much, just so much cool stuff. And then there's golfing as well. But then while we're all stuck in the uh, lecture hall. So. Right. It's a, you know, it's a unique place. I, I mean, I've, I've been to many hotels and this one has a charm about it. It's kind of, uh, it's a pretty old place, right? It's from like the early 1900s or even the 1800s or. I, I forgot exactly, but I think it's, it's definitely old and I know they built upon it. Um, and then there's a bunker. And now I've never done the bunker tour yet, even though how many times I've been there. Right. <laughs> but there's a bunker that uh, was used as a fallout for um, for for the government, which is now decommissioned, and now you can do a tour of it. But if there was any sort of you know catastrophe or national disaster or whichever, um, you know, I don't know if it was for the president, but it was for uh, high level government officials. They could stay there, um, and they would they would uh, be a fallout shelter there. And uh, so they do bunker tours there. So you can actually see that. I think there was a Christmas movie film there. And I think they still show that Christmas movie sometimes. Um, it's also be very beautiful during Christmas time. They just light it up. It's amazing. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think anyone, it's well worth the trip. Uh, I'm coming from New York and um, I'm, I'm excited to come there. I remember last year I had some downtime when I first arrived. I walked around the grounds and it was a really beautiful place. Uh, nature, the whole nine yards. So um, check out the link. Uh, we'll have a link to the conference as well as to the ultrasound course and you can register. It's uh, about five weeks away now, six weeks away. So I'm um, excited to see you there, Rudy, as well as anyone else who may join us. And uh, Rudy, thanks for coming on the podcast. And uh, I'll see you in a month. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate, and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced produced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.